Welcome back. So today I'm working on trying to um, be able to throttle what games get sent to, or not throttle, but filter, and, and just filter as a means of prioritization. What games get sent to the Irwin AI classifier? Um, so basically, we're going to learn everything about Scala today. Uh, all this... <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, why don't I just commit what I had working first, and then we'll try to make it work better. Um, so before I go way, way, way down deep down the rabbit hole... Um, and all this is just learning the freaking syntax, because I understand the concepts, it's just writing the actual damn code is difficult. Um, yeah, whatever, let's do that. To do, uh, probably use Leela-ism or what To cleanly await future. There we go. Um, this is actually awaiting a future. This is awaiting a result. Uh, this result is going to be a list of user.id. Get add modules, get status, get log, gives me a previous commit message, get status, shows that we're about to commit the stuff, get commit, and then put our commit message in here, and get push origin this thing. So, um, and then we could take a look even on GitHub just to see what it is precisely that changed. Sorry for the blinding white screen there. Um, so... Wait. I pushed my branch. Why is my branch not showing as something that I recently pushed? I don't know. Okay. Uh, online top 50, here we go. Um, actually, I don't want to diff this, I want to diff... Oh, really? I have to do all that just to... Fine, if I, this is what it takes to do a diff, we'll do it. No big deal. Uh, I'm sure I could remember my password somehow. So, all I want is just a diff. So, yeah. Um, notion here was um, that we were applying uh, the leaderboard from the top 200 users, um, which is provided by... Oh, gosh. Why am I not on a dark theme? Let's get a dark theme. There we go. So there's this leaderboard here, specifically like this top 200 list, and uh, this top 200 list. Basically those are, I think the Blitz top 200 list, it was what was used to be passed into the Irwin classifier. And this includes players who have been offline the majority of the day, who aren't active, who, for some reason, we probably just don't need to be classifying. It probably doesn't have any additional load on the classifier. But, you know, what we should be doing is prioritizing, is a user online? And if so, then try to start classifying them. Looking at the leaderboard, you're, first of all, the leaderboard is not generated um, well, I guess, uh, my understanding is that the leaderboard is generated daily, so checking it every 15 minutes isn't going to do anything. 
um, because the list is generated daily. It's not generated on a 15 minute basis. Now maybe I'm mistaken about that. Maybe it is dynamically generated. I don't know. What's being classified um, is who's a cheater and who isn't. Um, right now this is still in an advisory context in terms of just advising moderators which users look suspicious um, but yeah point here is that we want to be able to classify in a timely fashion who's a cheater because um, moderation is a difficult effort for moderators and um, questions keep going back and forth for the last six months in the forum. There's not been an adequate answer in my opinion. And I want to get some clarity out there about why can't we get these things classified faster. Um, so that's my very opinionated opinion. I'm sure everybody has a different opinion, and there's tons of developers, tons of moderators, and I only see a very small portion of all of this because I myself don't get involved in the whole moderator side of this stuff because I'd rather not deal with people who lie to you. Um, that being the players who say, oh, I didn't cheat. And I don't want to, I personally am not going to put up with dealing with those people at the moment got enough things to worry about. I'd much rather just focus on doing the technology side of this, which is just writing the code, figuring out a good approach, and giving the moderators whatever tools help them get this done. Uh, so if moderators say that this is slow, then I want to try to find a way to improve that. Um, so anyway, what I changed here in a series of two commits uh, were these few lines of code. This is taking the top 200 list and saying for everybody on this top 200 list um, just double check that they aren't cheating. So this includes an international master, an international master, a grandmaster, another grandmaster, an international master, and so forth, who have always been on the top of this list there's really no point in checking them over and over and over. Uh, instead, it makes more sense to check, like, who's online? Who's recently joined? And this doesn't check that, but this checks at least who's online. Let's filter by that. Because these players who are on top of the list, I don't know if you can actually see if they're online or not. Um, but I wager that, like, most of the day, these players probably aren't online. Um, I don't know whether, I'm assuming this green indicator here means that they are online. I, you would think that if you hover over it, it would tell you, but, um, but my supposition here is that most of the players on this list probably aren't online. Whereas if you're looking for the top 50 online players and passing that into here, that's going to change. And if um, that's going to actually catch people who recently joined the list but haven't yet made it into the top 200 but are among the top 50 online by rating. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I'm probably reinventing the wheel here. Um, developer, I don't know. Uh, I have, like, 24 hours ago advised all the developers um, that I'm working to improve this. Can anybody help me? I have no idea how Scala works. I have no idea how all this proprietary stuff that's written in a highly code-golfed fashion without very many comments Although there is a Wikipedia, there is a wiki to try to explain just how it is to use the most confusing aspects of the language in the most confusing possible fashion. How Leela, this project, uses Scala. Um, 
So basically, Scala is pretty difficult. Um, Leela adds another five levels of abstraction on top of Scala. Um, and, okay, it's nice that this does answer some questions. It would probably work better if I understood things like category theory. Um, I mean, I understand the concepts of functional programming and how you want to be able to define algebra <clears throat> and define functions that uh, you don't care how they chain together. It's not imperative. It's uh, I've worked with Scheme before. Um, the syntax in Scala is different. The syntax that Leechus uses to code golf um, the most complicated aspects of Scala, which are changing over time. Um, this just adds tons of abstraction, but uh, this abstraction does make the code overall far less verbose than it could be, which is a good thing uh, if you understand it, which I don't. So, yeah. If this were in Java, I would not even attempt this. I would say all hope is lost. Don't even bother. Um, but because it's in Scala, there is some hope that if I could just figure out the proper syntax, um, then yeah, we'll be fine. Um, so it's this sort of stuff that I gotta try to figure out. You got performance tweaks that do more efficient things than the base Scala does. Um, I what confuses me is that I've got um, in my code, I've got, uh, I guess I don't need the leaderboard screenshot anymore, so let's get that out of my set of tabs. I've got an interface here. Um, so let's go, you can see my import list. I'm importing from Leela user, which we can find at modules, user, source, main, user.scala. Uh, I have to spell view correctly because I'm not using ZSH or some intelligent sort of shell, which I probably should be using. Um, and then they got like a top 50. Um, okay, where was the top 50 thing? Um, Rep-R top 50 in modules. Searching only source code files. All right, so cached.scala. Uh, this is where we have top 50 online. And then I added top 50 online IDs. Um, again, this is probably highly redundant. There's probably a way that I could have just used top 50 online and then mapped the list of user to a list of user IDs. Actually, this isn't returning a list of user this is returning an async cache.single list of user, which differs from a Mongo cache, which differs from a Mongo cache.single, and I don't understand any of those differences because I don't know the Mongo cache library. I don't know the async cache library. I don't know what single means. Um, I do understand what a list is. I do understand the difference between a list of user objects versus a list of strings, which are user IDs. But yeah, I, there's so many libraries in play here and so many different functions and levels of abstraction that I am just hung out to dry here, you know? Um, so I, th I probably at some point have to go digging into like how the a cache sync or async cache is defined. This does define a timeout. Or I'm sorry, no, this defines an expiration of the asynchronous cache. So this returns um, a reference, which then I introspect elsewhere. Um, 
inside the Irwin Lee chess module, which determines, um, uh, let's see, how can I show this most cleanly? Uh, let's go over to Irwin API. So this here shows, oh, that's not very clean either. Um, no, really, this environment class is supposed to do all the setup. Oh, here we are. Okay, so yeah, every five minutes, we're going to, we have a scheduler that executes every a task every five minutes. That task says that we take all the leaders um, that are in standard tournaments and using this API, um, actually, I'm sorry. Sorry, using this tournament API, which returns a literal list, um, I'm sorry, a map, take that map, pass it into this function, which is defined in Irwin API, and that function, um, uh, let's see, tournament leaders. So, yeah, here we take the map of uh, tournaments to ranked players. And for each one of these um, elements in the tournament list, uh, we want to apply. Um, and this, this is where things are getting interesting. Um, I want to do something similar for what I'm implementing. We'll get there in a minute. But this says for every result in this map, go apply on that result when the result becomes available because we're dealing with the future we're not dealing with um, we're not dealing with an actual um, uh, how do I put this basically we have a contract with other classes that the data will become available as we need it um, so as it becomes available we want to ensure that we uh, are inserting into the queue every user id who's among the top x players of the tournament this seems to indicate that you want the top two percent of players in a tournament that we're going to check and pass in the user ID, the tournament, and just none as the final parameter. And there's various other ways, mechanisms for players being uh, added into this queue to be looked at. Um, this queue here, in turn, is used to um, stream to a third-party server these are the users we want you to look at. This is the context in which we want you to look at them, etc., etc. Um, so this is just one context where if you have tournament leaders, you want the top 2% of players to be checked, just in case they're up to anything. Um, let me go over to Erwin Request. This is where I should have started. I just forgot that uh, this is what was defined. So, moderators can report users, normal users can report users, and then uh, Lee Chess itself can report uh, users who are at the top 2% of tournaments or are on the top 200 list. And I want to change this to say just don't bother with the top 200 list. Look at the top 50 online players. And. Um, filter uh, since we can't prioritize uh, let me go back to this so we have a concept of a request that we're going to be passing to this service um, and this defines a priority I couldn't tell you why we didn't go with an integer but apparently we want a date time to be the priority whatever I guess that's fine um, and uh, val so basically the things that were added into this queue earlier should have the highest priority and this priority of the request is determined 
uh, by this function down here, which says based on where this request originated from, we're going to give it a priority between, well, you see everything we have here. So um, recently, you look through the code history for uh, LeechS. I couldn't tell you why they did this. Um, they probably could, but I can't. Uh, go over to Modules, Erwin. This figures out, um, oh, what was it? Tweak Erwin request generation. So that's the explanation that's offered. We changed the version number. Said so we're only going to take the top 2% of players from tournaments. And we're going to increase the priority of looking at players that are on the leaderboard. So this, this is where I'm starting to think, well, hang on a second. Most of the players on the leaderboard are offline. This really isn't... <clears throat> This isn't prioritizing in any way who's an online player and who's an offline player. Like somebody who plays in tournaments has tons of visibility. There are going to be complaints all over the forum that when somebody cheats in a tournament. But if somebody makes it on the leaderboard, unless they make it like in the top 10, nobody's going to even notice. So this might, from a technical perspective, be correct that, okay, we do want to take a look at players that are on the top 200 list. Um, but in a different sense, um, saying that players on the leaderboard have the same priority as players who are active in tournaments is a bit silly. Um, because players who are in tournaments, um, they're, they're playing tons of active games. Um, there was a recent uh, observation that a player got through two entire tournaments winning like 20 to 30 games in a row playing the perfect move every move with consistent move times and um, uh, so basically our answer to that was well yeah our moderators can't be there 24 uh, 7 to observe this so that's kind of why I'm like um, well, yeah, but we should have better automation tools. We understand technology, unlike some other chess servers. We can actually solve these problems. Or if not solve them, at least deal with them to a better degree than we are dealing with them. And not have to put up FUD to deal with it. We can actually get to the heart of the issue and um, figure out why it is that recent changes have um, made it such that the tools aren't working as well as they need to work for the moderators. Uh, again, I'm not sure what the motivation... Well, obviously the motivation here of reducing this from the top 5% of tournament players to the top 2 is that uh, we're just sending too many reports, we're sending more than are necessary. I haven't actually seen the reports, so I don't know, but it's pretty clear that I mean, if you look at the top 2% of tournament players, that will catch somebody who cheats every single game. And that that's at least a starting point. We should be able to catch players who do that. And, I mean, if people want to tune these numbers, by all means, do that. But just what surprised me is that we're not prioritizing tournament results over leaderboard results anymore. And leaderboard results now um, include players who are mostly offline. So we're adding tons of requests to this third-party service for players that aren't even bothering to play. And then we're saying, oh, well, it's slow. Well, I wonder why. I mean, it, it didn't used to be slow. So it could be a coincidence. But in any event, what we want to do, what I think is appropriate, is prioritizing based on who's actually online, and not just prioritizing based on priority days. Um, so that's my take. That Okay, we're defining a priority. I guess we're 
We're returning an integer and turning the integer into a date. And okay, whatever. I guess this is ensuring that things expire if they aren't looked at in some number of days. I don't know. It's confusing enough already. Um, unfortunately, this is emerging. Um, it's not perfectly documented at the moment. It's a challenging enough machine learning task without demanding that the developers also document it. But that means as I'm trying to get in here and make changes, I have to try to guess what, where to start making them. Um, so basically what I figured out after enough struggling with this is that um, by the time we're generating the requests, it's too late to figure out how to prioritize them because here we only have the user ID. We don't have the context. I mean, we do know whether this is reported by a tournament or by a leaderboard or such, but we can't figure out from this context is the user online because we don't have access to the cached users. Um, and we don't want to hit the database again for every time that we submit something into this queue. We don't want to hit the database and see, like, is the user online? Because that's kind of expensive. Um, so we want to make the best we can do with the data we have access to. And so, um, so backing up from that, we can go to this request generator, which says I want to take make requests from the leaderboard. Um, and this requires a list of user IDs and inserts requests to go investigate users that are on the leaderboard. Um, and so I changed this. Uh, well, I guess we had the diff up a minute ago. I could bring this diff back up. That'd probably be a constructive thing to do. So what I changed was saying don't get the top 200 list which includes a lot of offline players, but look at the top 50 online. Um, and honestly, what we should long term be doing is look at do look at the top 50 online and then filter that list based on who's gained rating points lately. Or look at the top 50 players who have gained the most rating points. So don't look at the leaderboard, but instead look at the top uh, players who are gaining the most points which is, I believe, something we have visibility to. We could build a database index for it. This wouldn't be that expensive. Again, this would be trivial to adjust, um, to put in an index and a way to look this up. There would be some expense, but there's already an expense for getting the top 50 online. Oh, in fact, that's what's generating this list here. This must be the top 50 online players. So, yeah, we've, we're already taking a hit to generate this list. We already have that data cached somewhere. Given that this is doable, it must be equally doable to look at a player-by-player -player basis. And we could see, hey, look, this player's gained 32 points lately. They've lost 19 points lately. And you can contrast this with a different player who, I don't know, this might have be different. No, not really contrast this to somebody lower down the list maybe. This player's gained 18 points lately, but there must be a way to also index players not by rating, but by rating gain. So, I mean, we could look at my account here, see that I've gained 75 ultra bullet rating points, and I guess most of my ratings are actually pretty stable, which surprises me a great deal, but maybe it shouldn't. Because, like, every time I stream on the site, I tend to, like, gain or lose 100 rating points. But, apparently, um, in recent history, that's not been the case. Okay, whatever. But we should be able to index by this plus 75, minus 62 sort of thing. In the same way that we're able to index by the actual ratings. That all said, um, so... I basically said we are going to use this user cache, uh, the same thing that's used to generate the players page. Where I got stuck 
is that this cache has a different method signature than that cache. So let's go over there and look at cached.scala, which is where we started looking at code at the beginning of the stream here. Um, so we see we got top 50 online, and I introduced top 50 online IDs based on that. Um, okay, here's the top 200 players um, on the site. And you see this offers a Mongo cache um, mapping IDs to lists of light performance ratings for users. It's a different API than we had for Top 50 Online, which instead of returning a Mongo cache, was returning an async cache.single, uh, which returns a list of user, as opposed to a mapping of user IDs to light performance lists that are Mongo cached. This is where I say, like, this is like an intractable problem, basically. <laughs> intractable is too strong of a term, but. Man, people who want to get involved in LeechS server development um, have not looked at the code by the, for the most part. And those who have looked at the code, um, they do make excellent contributions to the site. It takes great effort to try to code golf exactly the same way that the developers do this. And it's not just one developer writing this code. There are multiple developers touching this very file. Each of them does things slightly differently as circumstances warrant. Everybody has slightly different concepts. And um, since there's no money involved, there's no documentation of some very particular aspects that are constantly changing. One that recently changed was, in fact, using Mongo Cache instead of like async cache um, for performance gain, which is excellent. It works beautifully on the server. I just don't have any clue how it works, which is why I have to submit my code change to LeechS. Um, but my change is not in a state where it's ready to be submitted, even though I finally got it to compile because I finally got past all the syntax problems I was having. So, that's where the tirade begins, is that we're using third-party libraries, um, and we're using functions that were written across numerous files by various different developers for all sorts of different reasons. This was only conceived of for the purpose of displaying ratings on the players page. I said, well, we've got this information. We've, in fact, got this other function which had been written, um, which wasn't being used anywhere. So I just exposed that, returning the IDs of these players. I'm assuming there's no problem with having introduced another index here and whatever. If there is, I'm sure whoever code reviews this will say, uh, let's just use this thing instead somehow. and do a magic transformation that gets the IDs out of the list. Fine, I don't care. It's fine with me. All I needed was just the user IDs because the previous um, thing that we were doing using the, well, somehow we were getting user IDs out of this too. Um, somehow specifically being we we're doing all this stuff with like apply sequentially get the performance type ID and for the list of users for that performance type from the leaderboard. Notice that we're only doing this for the performance type of standard. We're not going to do the, or we're only going to do this for bullet, blitz, and classical, and ultra bullet. Don't know why we would need to do this for ultra bullet, but we do apparently. Because um, apparently somebody might cheat at that. I don't know. Anyway, we don't need to analyze the top 200 Ultra Bullet players every time. Let's just get the top 50 out of this list. But yeah, what this was doing was saying, go get all the performance categories for the standard um, 
chess. And for each of those performance categories, get the list of users. And for that list of users, generate requests um, based on the list of user IDs. So we take a list of users that was promised in a future and unfuturify that somehow. And that's where I'm a little bit confused is on what it means to do apply sequentially as opposed to what I did here using await which is the Scala way of using a future and saying I want the result of this after some duration or the maximum weight of such duration and I'm not sure how to say I don't care how long to wait um, just wait forever until we get a result but this probably isn't it um, what I need to do is figure out a way to do something like apply sequentially but apply sequentially is something that can only apply to a Mongo cache of this sort or that has this kind of mapping. It doesn't work for a cache which returns a list as opposed to a mapping of IDs to performances. So I, I tried using the syntax. It didn't quite work out. Um, so I should probably take a look at um, the, what we do for futures in Leela and see is there a way to Leela if I this usage such that it does wait instead of uh, well what I did is said assume that we don't have to wait at all get that result that re gets returned as a list of user IDs which is equivalent to the list of user IDs here but out of a different source so we it returns the actual data of interest I mean, yeah, Ornicar is the big, largest contributor to this, but um, he has much discussion with um, uh, other developers uh, and even to some extent the admins of the server. So they talk about what it is they need to do with third-party libraries, and I mean, ultimately he's the one who codes and our code reviews this by a long shot but he wrote this file whereas the Irwin module uh, which is over where is it just over at modules Irwin we'll see that this is largely written by James Clark um, so if I just go like into uh, what would be a good place? Erwin Stream? Well, I don't know if this helps. No, this doesn't help, but um, somewhere in here. Oh wait, does this show the history for the package? Oh, that's nice. Okay, so apparently this is also... Well, so he's writing... Hmm, okay. Well, I stand corrected. This package is also developed by him. So, James Clark had focused mainly on just the third-party service that does all the machine learning. Yeah, no, I, I do mean that that was written by James, but also, um, this was, there's been a lot of discussion between, um, James and Tebow here. Um about what it is that uh, Lee Chess needs to provide to that service. Um, I assume at some point there was some code review between them just to make sure that they're returning the right values from, I'm sorry, the providing the right input from the server so that uh, the third party service can do whatever machine learning it needs to do and return the appropriate values that can be processed by this. But the actual code here um, uh, was probably written a little bit ad hoc but as like the requirements evolved and so that's why I just like this module is like the most confusing thing ever server side is because it was written as requirements evolved not because there were multiple developers so I do stand corrected there uh, yeah he wrote the wrapper here um, this wrapper did change a number of times throughout development you can obviously see that from the commit history that 
it did evolve over time. As opposed to, like, this cached... I mean, the cached users also did evolve over time. But this sort of stuff has been rewritten so many times that so much thought has been given to it. Whereas um, the Irwin module, that wrapper, is pretty new. And the third-party service that James wrote is fantastic. It does great machine learning. Um, I mean, having something that does machine learning at all is an excellent starting point, and he put tons of work into developing and testing it, and it works great. Um, it's just that if you feed in too much data, you can't expect that everything, and if you set everything to the same priority, as apparently we're now doing. Um, uh, what's it? Where was it? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong module. Um, if we're apparently setting tons of data all to the same priority as we're doing here, where tournaments and leaderboard have the same priority, then we have to make sure that we're doing due diligence and filtering what we send to it in the first place. Yeah, no, it's black magic. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that it's... Um, eventually going to be smarter than a human. Might be there already, I don't know. Uh, certainly of assistance to moderators, and the more data you pump in, the better... Well, as long as the data is of a good quality, um, then the more that moderators can provide feedback and say that it's doing a good job or it's doing a bad job or whatever, Eventually, it should be in a position where if somebody's cheating every game, it can just stomp down on them and say, you know, we're going to say that that user's cheating, and um, if they want to dispute it, they can take it up with the moderators, and there might, um, but we have enough confidence in this classifier at some point. Maybe not today, but at some point we'll have that confidence that at least for some class of users, for some activation threshold, um, this can act automatically. Yeah. So, I was saying earlier, and um, uh, that's quite the name there, isn't it? Are You My Dad No Joke? Like, how do I even shorten this name? I got it. I know how we're going to shorten this. We're going to say you. You seems like a good abbreviation for that name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know it gave uh, Zug some trouble. Only because you is like the most hilarious way to abbreviate that. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So. So as not to be confused amongst the other usernames we've done at some point. Um, but yeah, you, um, I was explaining earlier that I was trying to figure out how to extract um, from this, uh, what I've got is a future of list of type user ID and right now the only way I could figure out to extract a list of user ID from a future of list of user ID um, is to use this await that's provided by um, Scala. But when I replaced, um, do I still have my code diff? I don't still have my code diff. Oh no, how horrible. Let's go find my code diff. It's somewhere here in the network. Okay, that's slow. That is so slow. Fine, we'll go this way. And we'll go over to my repositories. Got Leela. Here's my branch. Here's my diff. So what I was saying um, was that Leela provides this way of extracting more efficiently from futures somehow. 
under certain contexts where we're doing things with maps and we need to do some really performance intensive things, we use this. Don't know exactly why. Don't know exactly how that works. I get the concept of having a future, um, which allows you to say that I have a reference to, well, in Java it would be to an object, and that that object promises through some contract that I can eventually get a result, um, which I think was a Java 6 or 7 construct of, I think 6. Um, of being able to say that I want to define, no, this is Java 7. I want to be able to define a object that allows me to say that I can invoke execute on that object and eventually return a result of a given class or type. Um, so we're going to take a look at how it is that we do this in Leela that differs from how we do it in Scala, and is there some way that I can do things cleanly? Is there a flat map method? Um, so yes, it returns a future which contains the full list, as opposed to a list containing futures of type user. Um, so yeah, that's a thought. Um, and this is where I kind of struggled, and let me bring up the code and try this out. I just got flustered with this and eventually did it the only one way I knew how to do it. And, um, yeah, so in theory I should be able to do something like this, where I just say flat map based on the data source here, which would be, um, this data source uh, so that we say this flat map and then pass the results of the future into the from leaderboard uh, function uh, let me comment this out and then we say sbt compile assuming I've oh can you link futures.scala alright seems nightbot is reasonably well behaved somehow uh, let me bring this up apply sequentially yeah that's where I was gonna go next and see like if there's some way I need to apply that I'm struggling with the syntax here um, let me bring that up on the screen as well so that other people can see this beautiful code um, let's open a new tab from this new tab, say we're going to go to source. Yeah, I was going to go there next, but um, let's get there right away because we're compiling. We can multitask. Um, okay, where was this? This is at. Um, unfortunately, my chat viewer is not hooked up to my computer here, so. Package Leela Common source main I think this one and then we're saying down here uh, apply sequentially I actually could have done in fact since I clicked the wrong thing let's search for it this way Yeah, here we are, future.scala. So I was looking at the wrong future. There's multiple futures to find in... Yeah, you're right. Source main future. So this is the function of interest that we're calling elsewhere. Um, so this is how we would do a match. This is what I was struggling with earlier, that I needed a list of a type and to apply something. 
so yeah, this is the algebra that I was looking for. I was looking in the wrong file, basically, and couldn't find this. And getting very confused by how the code was working. Um, uh, so yeah, this this makes a good deal of sense. Um, so what this is saying is that I have a return type, a return type of a. Um, I'm applying a function across a list of a. Um, so, if if I understand correctly, that the way Scalus um, writes this out, we have a parenthesis, an end parenthesis, another parenthesis. I think each of these indicates a separate argument which is kind of confusing to me, because I think I've also seen um, Scala indicate a multiple argument list. Um, or maybe this is saying, okay, the return type is F, oh, right, right, I'm sorry. This is the R parameter list. This is the return type. And this is what the expression is for this return type, uh, or this is the function to be evaluated. Um, right, and so yeah, these are the input arguments. So apply sequentially for class A for this function and for this list, do the following and evaluate and return of type F unit. Um, that's right. Um, yeah, this syntax is going to trip me up, especially because this is like some of the more complex stuff. Well, I mean, you could do much more complex things than this, but this is not walk in the park sort of coding. Right. Yeah, so for class A, for a list of type A and for a function that accepts uh, type A and returns F unit, I want to apply for this list, uh, this function, or I want to evaluate it. Apply is kind of a lazy word for that. We want to evaluate the function for um, this list based on this class in the same similar manner to how you'd specify uh, well strongly typed operations elsewhere yeah so oh right right this is the future operator which is defined in Leela isms and can have a couple meanings as you're stating um, but what this does is it executes this, or evaluates this, and says then after this is done executing, then execute this. And do not depend on the return value of this execution. Whereas there's a different form of this operator that um, allows you to say I'm execute this, take that return value or side effect, and pass that return value or side effect into the next thing to be executed. So this is a way of iterating through a, well, <laughs> iterating's wrong because this isn't imperative programming, but this is a way of um, uh, recursively evaluating a list. Um. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and this is where, like, having more background in category theory, I should read that book. Like, I mean, I... I understand there are many beautiful things you can do with strong typing and with categories, and I appreciate that that's a very beautiful thing, but having a more intimate familiarity with all the vernacular and the actual mathematics would help me 
troubleshoot this sort of thing when I get some really strange error messages. Wait. Okay, so now I'm not getting an error message. Um, what the hell? I tried this earlier. It didn't work earlier. I... I'm so confused. I did try this. I guess I'm just dumb. Yeah, well, no, but I think it would help me at least parse the error messages better when they come back. Um, like, being familiar with the category theory would probably help me see when I look at some set of symbols to be able to figure out where to start parsing this set of symbols. Like, you saw how badly I even struggled with, yes, this is the function declaration, this is the return type. <laughs> Uh, when there's an error message, God help me, there's, yeah, there's no solving that. Um, so there's two ways I can approach that. One is just through practical experience. Trial and error, figuring out, okay, if I get this error message, if I write the code this way, this is what happens. Another would be taking a closer look at the theory, and then from that theory, understanding how the symbols layer upon each other to con um, how a compiler might try to deal with this sort of situation and what kinds of messages it would return and why would help. Oh, okay, so we'll get to that in one second. Let me clean this up first. Um, uh, so don't need that, get add this, um, get status, get commit amend, get push f. Never supposed to do this with stuff that multiple people are working on, but I'm the only person working on that branch, and nobody's looking at it other than us on the stream, so I can force push. Um, but yeah, you're you're asking, like, in this particular context, what does that operator mean? Um, and I'm going to assume, maybe incorrectly, that you're familiar with this. Um, that, um, that you're familiar with this particular syntax that Leela defines that allows you to sequence a future and an effect. Um, so this attempts to explain the usage of the operator um, where you uh, apply or you I think what this is doing and this has multiple ways of doing it is chaining a future with another future saying execute these in sequence versus saying execute these in sequence and take the result of the first execution and pass that into the second execution. Um, right, we're dropping the result. Okay, so okay, so your confusion isn't about what this operator is causing to happen, but rather how it is that this works at all. I mean, yeah, I'm kind of with you there. Um, because I understand I've written very small parts of a compiler. I've written enough to understand that this is a way to identify a list as head and tail and apply function on head and recurse and so forth. Um, but um, yeah, as for how it is that you can say I've got a list of type A and a function that returns f unit based on a. How is it that when I do this, um, that um, I, will, I apply the function on the head, and then recurse on the tail, which is the set of all the other elements after the head, and apply the function again? Um, but how is it you know, that this function, which takes a type A and returns F unit 
is able to process both the head. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, we're not saying recurse on the function, we're saying apply sequentially on the tail. Um, and, and yeah, this is where things are somewhat confused. It's well, how do we, um, how is this function return, retaining its state across this uh, recursion? Um, yeah, I think the confusing part of this is that uh, the list, uh, I mean, I've seen a list implemented as a head plus a reference to the next thing in the list. Uh, like uh, Stockfish does this, where you'll say, I've got a head of the list and I have a pointer to next element. It rarely does this, but it sometimes does this. And many other C++ and other libraries implement lists the same way as a singly link list. And so it's pretty clear how, rec well, you don't use tail recursion in this way. You just say, I'm going to take this item and iterate through every item in the list and keep my aggregate state as I'm going along. Um, but every item in that list, including the head, is of the same data type. So like the object that is the list is also the data type that retains the information. Um, which is not, it's not a very clean abstraction at all because it doesn't separate the concept of I have a data structure versus the concept that I have a list of this type of data structure. And that data structure is kind of built into every element of the list. It's just a mess that way. Um, and I hope that that's not the case here, but I don't know. Maybe a list of type A is indeed implemented as a singly linked list where every item is itself an object and a pointer to the next object. That'd be an ugly way to do it. Um, I guess it depends, like, what kind of list are we talking about? We're talking about, well, this is, I don't see us importing anything from Java. We are in the Leela common module, so we might have a special list here. If we don't, then I have to assume that we're just using the built-in Scala list. Uh, I'm sorry, the built-in Java list type, which would make the most sense, but I don't want to jump to assumptions right away, or jump to conclusions right away. I say as I like digress into the most complicated possible theory, but I want to exclude that possibility first. Yeah, I don't see a definition of lists, so this has got to be just a standard Java list. Even though we're not importing Java util list, that's probably fine. Um, but yeah, how is it that this kind of list tail recursion is done? Given just the syntax of this, I, yeah, I mean, I understand the concept of recursion, but how the syntax achieves it, I don't know. Um, maybe Leelaisms has some clue. Maybe. We've got features, we've got options, we've got list functions, future shortcuts, type aliases, but I'm assuming anything that's not explicitly identified in here is not weird shit you'd only see in Leela. <laughs> Disclaimer, this is beautiful by the way. Most of these Leela-isms are driven by a compulsive tendency to play code golf. However, they also present benefits in terms of type safety. I, I argue this, these aren't separate. Yeah, I, I agree. As good. I don't need to say I argue. I can say I agree that these aren't separate concepts, that if you have code that your developer is capable of reading and capable of maintaining, then they can leverage their knowledge. Um, so by doing code golf and making things as succinct as possible, um, 
this helps him ensure that he's writing the code correctly and guaranteeing type safety and performance and etc cetera, etc cetera, everywhere um, but yeah he doesn't explain how it is that uh, lists work which means that he's probably not doing weird shit with lists that whatever we're doing here is somehow just native to Scala native to Java I don't know so yeah we've got a list match of head and tail um, so for this we apply the function on the head okay yeah so this is the case that we match um, case nil we just return f unit um, this also confuses me and it really shouldn't I guess but um, I guess f unit is just a discarded result or a whatever that says that we've finished applying all of the well wait I think that's the point is that this doesn't need to return anything I mean, this is returning an F unit, which basically says that I've just finished execution. Um, it's not like we're actually returning, uh, what's it? I'm trying to think of the Ruby equivalent of this, where you reduce a list. Like summing the list, you say list.sum, and that reduces this list into a single value. This is just returning F unit, saying I'm done. Um, so the only question here is how do how is it that we're still applying across the list? Um, like how is it that we go from list of A to head and tail? I'm guessing that the list implementation must be that the head is a value and that the tail itself is a list even though we're not requiring that the tail must be a list we happen to know that the tail is a list because otherwise the sequential application would fail so that's how it's working is that the data structure that somehow got created has a head which is just a single element and a tail which is a list um, that's my assumption. Yeah. Well, no, I think the point is that you just want to apply the function across all the elements of the list, um, or across all the elements of type A. You don't need to return a value because all we're trying to do is apply a function. We're not trying to do a reduction. Now, maybe there's a reduction here somewhere, too, but maybe, that, maybe that's where stuff I was looking at earlier with like pimped future um, was saying that okay we want to apply for each do this stuff but um, yeah is there anything here that says um, for each I want to apply a function um, <laughs> I'm not seeing anything that's saying do this for a list though I mean, I've seen all across the code base, there's cases where we apply future and then apply another future and apply a third future and so forth, and we chain all these futures together. And um, as opposed to saying, I'm going to take a list, reduce it, return either an integer or a string or itself a list, and then take that list and process it through another thing and return a list. And no, the what I've seen repeatedly is pattern in Leechess is that we'll use these operators like this operator here which says apply a side effect and then return the original data and then apply a side effect and then return the data and then so on and so forth and so like this operator is used quite frequently to say I want to do a thing and do another thing and do a third thing all operating on the same um, instance Um, right, 
yeah, the apply sequentially, all we care about is that it's doing the application. We don't care about the return value. We just care that it does the side effect that it's supposed to do. Um, which, in the case of what we were looking at, the side effect was um, that for every attribute in the list, um, well, no. Yeah, for every attribute in each of the lists here, um, go call from leaderboard. And from leaderboard just enqueues to Irwin. Well, not directly, but it puts into a queue an element corresponding to the user. Um, so let me refresh this. Oh, can I? Refresh doesn't do anything. Okay, F5 to refresh. Is this going to blow up everything? No, it's okay. It's cool. Um, so yeah, this shows the latest changes. I didn't actually need this import statement. I should get rid of it, clean it up, um, as it's just one more distraction. Um, and add this, uh, commit, push, and refresh our diff. So yeah, now that import statement's no longer in the diff, I should probably compile the code to make sure it still compiles. Um, but yeah, we don't really care about the top 50 or the top 200 for every performance type. Really, from the leaderboard, what we care most about are the players who. Um, I mean, okay, maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit here. Maybe we do care about things other than blitz ratings. Maybe this actually... Well, this is interesting. It doesn't act... This list includes players who do other variants. But, hey, if somebody makes the top 50 list in a variant, and they're cheating, we'd probably take a look at that. I don't think the fact that we're doing classical chess versus some variant is um, important or to determine whether or not we should automatically look at them. I just think, like the top 50 list here, seems like the top 50 you'd want to keep an eye on. If somebody suddenly joins the top 50, fine. What we actually want to sort by is not the rating, though. We want to sort by who gained the most rating points uh, lately, or I don't know. Actually, this is fine. Whatever. Um, we could always add more filters to this and say this is too many people to look at. It's not enough people. But the important point is that these users are online and capable of playing games. And probably have played games recently and probably will continue to play games in the future. And if some people are playing excellently, then sure, it wouldn't hurt to take a look. Um, as opposed to saying for every one of the top 200 lists, like the top 200 classical players, uh, these are some people who probably have not logged in in a couple days. There's no need to keep telling Irwin to go look at these people. Now, granted, if the people haven't played games recently, it probably discards the reports pretty quickly. But, yeah, we want to take a look at top 50 online as opposed to top X from the leaderboard. Um, plus, the I mean, this... Well... I don't know, it feels like this is less to look at, but also this helps us prioritize, because this all went back to what I said way, way earlier in my explanation, that um, because we're not able to prioritize at a request level, because of the way that the code is written, where we define a request, um, let's view this file. We define a request as having a priority that's a date time. And we fill in that date time based on was this a moderator who sent this or whatnot. So this is a really inflexible way of defining 
the priority. I don't have visibility to whether the user that we're reporting is online or not in this context. Getting that visibility would take an act of Congress in terms of lots of changes in the code base and probably wouldn't perform well and it would end up hitting caches that we don't want to be hitting. So instead, let's take a known good data source which has online user IDs and use that as our source, as the motivation. Because we can't prioritize for people who are online uh, versus offline, um, we'll instead say only look at players who are online um, when investigating people who are on the leaderboard. Um, and yeah, okay, I had to add this. There might have been a cleaner way to not have to add this that could have maybe used the list of users. There probably is. Um, but this is probably also, I mean, this is using a cache single. This should probably all be rewritten using the same performance enhancement code uh, that was done for other caches that uses Mongo cache, which is apparently the new latest greatest way of doing things. Um, but yeah, we should probably do things that way. So the fact that I'm adding another index is not the end of the world because this code's going to have to be rewritten anyway. Um, so, oh, right. So before I pull request this, let's make sure it compiles. Let's spell compile with an L-E instead of an E-L. Um, so what have I missed here? Right, yeah, it just returns F unit, which means that it's applied the futures. It's similar to void in that it's not a real, well, I mean, it is a value, but it's a valueless value, if that makes sense, or a dataless value. Um, oh, that's funny. So I was able to define, this is something I had to do recently, I defined a shortcut key for, um, control tab that if even if I'm full screened I can control tab forward um, and get to the next tab in this browser. Um, what I failed to do was define a control key for control shift tab so I can go back. Um, some months ago there was a some changes to Chrome, Chromium and or Google Secure Shell that um, made it so you have to define your own shortcut for going forward a tab. Um, and on any other tab, I can shift tab to get back. But on this one, I can't shift tab to go back. This instead just sends a Z to the console for some reason. All right, but this compiles successfully. I mean, minus all the Zs that are in this message, it says success. Um, which means if I were to deploy Erwin on my server, and if I had active players and the whole nine yards, that this would work just fine. They have a staging environment. They have ways of testing this. Um, I'm just getting this code out to them as a means of showing, like, this is an idea for, since we can't prioritize based on our players online, let's when we look for players on the leaderboard, just only look at online players. Um, it's pretty crude, but hopefully it'll be a wake-up call saying that um, thanks to a different recent change um, in modules Erwin, that there this has exposed some room for improvement. Um, because now that we're prioritizing um, looking at users who are on the leaderboard equal to prioritizing users who are in tournaments, um, now those are of equal priority in terms of looking at those. We should try to do a better job filtering who it is that we're looking at in this such that tournament reports are still processed in a timely manner. Oh, Nightbot, why you shoot? Nightbot, why you do this? 
Um, I guess I'll have to add to the Nightbot regulars list this new alternate account name that we've created. But yeah, I see the link. Category theory for programmers. Right. Yep, yep, yep. This is the thing I should be reading. Oh, silly Nightbot. Yeah, that's a cool article, though. Um, let me go add you uh, again to Nightbot's list of trusted people. Um, so I go over to nightbot.tv, log in. And then log in with Twitch. And then authorize the login with Twitch so that we're actually logged in. So after all that login business, then we go to the regulars list. And then we add user to this list. Um, and did the copy and paste so I don't typo this name because it's quite a long name. Oh yeah, that's interesting. I've got Ask Stockfish on my list. I haven't seen that bot here in a long time. I wonder where it went. Alright, so... Um... Probably don't need some of these other names here. So let's get rid of a couple old names for that name. Oh, there's also Penguin GM Bot. Have not seen in a while. All right, so um, I forget how Justin was helping, but I haven't seen Justin here forever too, so he doesn't necessarily need to be on the list. Um. Okay, so cool. <laughs> no, that's fine. It wouldn't deal it wouldn't do to have Nightbot regularly timing you out for no reason, so I've added you to the list. That's fine. Um yeah, no, I definitely appreciate the help. I don't know why I thought I tried this. Apparently I'm just dumb. Or I don't know. It's been a week, but uh the weekend does begin. Um, so yeah, let me put the pull request in. After first refreshing to make sure I've got my latest changes. I mean, GitHub figures out how to resolve that anyway, but... Um, what was my commit message? So here's our commit message. Uh, put my explanation in here. Since we do not prioritize, um, should be a request for comment. Since we do not prioritize uh, tournament, or since um, we no longer prioritize uh, tournament assessments over leaderboard assessments. Let's at least filter leaderboard assessment. Um, let's say requests. So we no longer prioritize one set of requests over the other. Let's at least prioritize, at least filter these requests limiting to online players. Um, for performance reasons, let's filter uh, limiting to online players. Or let's consider filtering liver based upon online players 
rather than based upon all leaderboard players to reach the C um, bearing in mind that to make the, that players on the top 200 list at some point do need to play a game in uh, I don't know that that doesn't even require explanation um, Mm -hmm. Great pull request. All right. This is a request for comment. No reviewers. No one assigned. No labels. Um, apparently, I can't request a review. Only a maintainer can do that. So, yeah, we'll see. This will generate some feedback. Um, if this doesn't, then I'll have to create an issue and link the issue to the pull request and eventually the issue will gather attention, but hopefully this will help improve the performance. Um, I should probably cite this difference here. So. Let's do, 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 put this in brackets. Linking to the code difference. There we go. Yeah, let's try to do something sensible. It's probably a stupid request because probably the right answer is not the one that I came up with because I didn't do any of the coding for either the wrapper or Irwin itself. Um, um, yeah, I don't think there's... Well, let's see. Let's find Irwin. I don't think there's really great screenshots here, but I could be wrong. Oh yeah, never mind. I'm very mistaken. Yeah, I didn't do any of this coding. Uh, this is just the presentation layer, but this shows all the data that was passed back by Irwin. I'm glad that we're able to expose this. But yeah, I didn't do any of the coding of the machine learning side of this. Well, on the, actually that's wrong. I did contribute some code. It got rejected. I contributed it again. Got, like, partially accepted. But ended up being one of the key ideas that made this so effective. So that's what I get for having taken a class um, a semester about data mining and just doing my own learning on the side. Um, that I had some sensibility as to what as to some data transformation that would help out with better filtering um, data. This gives us some kind of insight. This is, I, I'm glad that these numbers all get exposed because this doesn't tell a person what it takes to get away with cheating. It does tell people that we're on top of this. Um, and honestly, getting away with cheating is going to become harder and harder the more that this bot or the more that machine learning goes on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to get away with cheating in a single game. Consistently getting away with cheating is going to be difficult. And if you manage to do it convincingly enough that not only can bots not detect you, but your opponents and the moderators can't even figure it out, then is there really a problem? Yeah, there is, but um, I'd actually like to think that at some point there will be some realization that, okay, 
yes, if I throw a billion dollars into coming up with the perfect environment, I can come up with something that I get away with cheating every time. But who's going to spend that kind of money? Uh, from a practical perspective, we'll be able to catch almost every possible cheater. We'll be able to be caught through some combination of, um, or through a constructive combination of um, machine learning and moderator um, human intervention. And eventually, there will come a point where this classifier will far exceed our moderator's ability to um, do things intelligently. Eventually, there will be enough confidence in the machine that people will believe and trust it. And this is a case where, I mean, honestly, a moderator is not going to know who's cheating. They'll have visibility to all the data, but um, this classifier is going to do a better job than any moderator ever could. We're not there yet. Um, it's probably a far, far thing in the future, but ultimately that, that would be something. Um, but yeah, what's imperative now is that this classifier, um, well, two things. One, that it catch obvious cheaters. Uh, so that moderators aren't wasting their effort on that. And two, that it not generate false positives and accuse um, or falsely label people as cheaters. And, you know, I think part of what would make this a healthier ecosystem as well would be if people could just get over the concept of cheating and just say, there's a class of users who are engine users. There are separate class of users who are just normal users. We don't need to use the word cheat everywhere. It's more than sufficient to just say they're engine users. Fix does this um, and quite publicly labels people as um, being engines um, or using computer assistance. And those players can still play but most people will choose not to play them. Um, then again, signing up for fixed accounts is more difficult than signing up for Lee Chess accounts, so maybe... Uh, I don't know. Maybe the payout matrix is different. But I'd like to think that... Well, I don't need to get into politics here. I'm just saying that it's worth considering the possibility of just publicly labeling people, letting people know, hey, you've been caught. This is why you're not able to play, as opposed to making them go over to the Q&A and, like, for the thousandth time ever, somebody puts in a question, hey, I can't play rated games. Why is that? And I'm like, really? <laughs> They still ask the questions, and it's more effort for them to ask, but after the first time they ask it, I mean, now you've trained somebody. They know now how to figure out, well, if I seek a game and I can't find an opponent, it's because um, um, I've been labeled. And we explain this to people in the Q&A and the forums and such because these questions make it out there, but whatever. I, I just tend to think that, that that's my own personal perspective from that just fixed it things really well, and I don't see I don't see the benefit in shadow banning users. It's a clever, it's an entertaining thing to do. It works well for a great many things, but I'm not convinced that for cheating or for engine use that it's the right thing. For other things, sure, whatever. That's just my two cents. But what do I know? I'm not a moderator. I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. What I am helping is trying to ensure that these reports are processed in a timely manner so that we don't get things over and over and over and over and over in the forum where somebody asks the same question. And that question is, um, where'd it go? 
Where was the most recent iteration of this question? Let's go to my forum posts. From my forum posts, um, let's go to, what was it? Yeah, here we go. Tournament's wrecked. So, a really thoughtful explanation saying that this, I've observed a player, I'm not, this person doing this forum post is not insane. They actually did see a pe person get, like, over two, th or a new player is thrashing 2000s and got through two entire tournaments, getting first place in one tournament, getting second place in another tournament, cheating every single game, playing perfect moves throughout. It was pretty blatantly obvious. And just, okay, human moderator efforts aren't able to be there 24-7, and I get that. But that shouldn't prevent us from dealing with the problem. And the problem is that some people blatantly cheat, and we've got a classifier which can help us, um, and if we're processing the right people, if we're looking at the right games, looking at the right users, we should be able to turn around these results pretty quickly. Um, a couple days went without any moderator responding to this, which I thought this was a really well explained post, saying this guy blatantly cheated through dozens of games. Not this user, but somebody that they observed. And it took like an hour for this to get reported. Um, and I think we can do better. I really do. Um, we don't need paranoia. We can actually openly discuss, yes, things are not working as well as they should. Um, and okay, so we finally did get some responses in here. And the response is that, like, okay, we do have stuff for automated marking, but it's actually lagging a few days behind at the moment. And why is it lagging behind a few days? Well, because code changes were made that says we're not going to make processing tournament reports the highest priority because we also need to catch people who are atop the leaderboards. Fine, that's an okay priority. But do we need to catch people on the leaderboards who aren't even online? Probably not. And so, unfortunately, discussing ideas in the forums leads to interesting suggestions, um, such as tracking the web page or mouse of a chess player or tracking the movement of the chess pieces might be an option to discover who are using assistance. If someone is pressing example a shortcut on the keyboard, like shift and spacebar, or always pressing in an area outside of the chessboard, they are probably using an engine. Feature request, a sent upon medium indicator of the players to filter out the stronger players that have a near perfect sent upon, filtering out the players that rarely blunder or rarely do errors or rarely do imperfections, a filter like the rating window to select players for a game, a send upon category filter could, I mean, you get these suggestions in the forum because the forum is a difficult place for discussion. I'm uh, like, great, we'll get right on that. Wonderful. Thanks for your feedback. Um, and I was amused to see, um, he's actually pretty serious about this suggestion and suggested it again. i like, okay. Sure, great. I mean, he might be right. He could be right. We could engineer this entire thing all around centipons, and it might help. But, um, you know, doing things in this one very limited way, um, it might help. It might deal with the problem. But let's address the larger issue. The larger issue is that the machine learning is a few days behind because of recent code changes, recent being in the last month. And we should try to do something um, to deal with that issue because that should, in theory, encompass this and dozens of other possible improvements. Um,
yeah, tapping out to change the music depends how good the music is. If you're listening to good music, you're getting assistance. If it's bad music, um, then yeah, that, that doesn't count as assistance. Just, just to make that clear. You know. <laughs> um, but, yeah. There's so much... I mean, yeah, we'll, we're taking this suggestion seriously, but there's a larger problem. The larger problem is that the damn machine learning stuff needs to catch up. Um, I don't mean that from a perspective that it's bad or anything. It's not. It's quite good. But um, it needs to be efficient because the requirements that it's trying to satisfy are pretty demanding. And I think in the case where we're saying process everybody on the leaderboard, um, I don't think that that's the right place to start. I don't think you want to start with the top 200 bullet players. I think you want to start with like who's atop this list. And if we wanted to, we could expand this from 50 to 200 or however many we want to expand it to. And then add some filters to say, okay, we trust some of these users. Like, somebody's probably got a GM title, we might not need to check as often as a different user. Because people are going to report these grandmasters and masters anyway. Uh, we probably don't need to routinely um, check on those, at least on an automated basis. We can probably trust titled users, if I had to guess. And because people are going to report the titled users anyway. Moderators might even report the titled users if they see something up. If there's questions, I mean, these people do get tons of attention. They don't need automated reports going on. What we need the automated reports for at the moment, our highest priority, is for the people who make it onto the top of this online players list who are new players. And, um,. So my coach age doesn't check for new players. It checks for who's on the list. Uh, so what we probably should do is expand that list to 200, or however many we want to expand it to, and then apply a filter for like who's new, or who's suddenly gained rating points and is playing way outside of how they normally play. They don't have to be a new account per se. They don't need to have a high ratings deviation. All they need is to have um, whatever it is that makes them the class of interest players to filter and look at automatically. Beyond that, um, I mean, people who make it up here are typically playing in tournaments, right? I mean, if I just randomly pick somebody, let's say Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, playing an 01 bullet game. Okay, playing a half-minute bullet game. I guess I'm mistaken. I, I would have thought that people atop the list got there not by going to the lobby. I mean, there's not even a half-plus-o thing in the lobby. Like, you look in the lobby, there's not even a button for half-minute chess. So, I was expecting that people who are on the top 200 probably aren't going through the lobby, but that might be wrong. Um, let's pick somebody else out of the list just randomly. Let's, I don't want to pick Chess Network. He's a good guy. How's he play? He doesn't go, well, no, he is playing in a tournament, like the Hourly Bullet Arena. Okay, let's pick somebody else out. Let's pick, um, Just Strategy. Just Strategy. He's not playing in tournaments. Okay, let's pick another player out. Let's pick out a uh, guy with all capital letters in his name. Also plays in the lobby. So, yeah. I guess the, most of the people on this list aren't playing in the tournaments. I was going to say there's probably a ton of overlap between online players on this list versus people who are on the top, but um, let me guess that if we just like pick number 50 here, MIG. MIG is apparently not playing in tournaments either, so I guess people who make it on this list um, 
and generally aren't playing in tournaments. And that's kind of curious to me. I guess once you get to the top, you're not so interested in tournaments other than the elite tournaments. Like we were seeing Chess Network was playing tournaments. No, he actually plays the hourly bullet. But I think I've seen... Like, of what I've seen of titled players, they tend only to play in these elite tournaments, if I remember right. Maybe I don't. Um, so, okay. Yeah, my point is that I'm just trying to put the tools in place to help us deal with reports in a more timely fashion. And even if my code change is utter crap, at least it'll get the point out there that I'm interested in improving this. Let's take a look. I'm not completely out of my mind. There's some points meriting discussion here. Or maybe I am out of my mind. Who knows? Maybe improving this is not something Lee Chess is interested in. But maybe some compromise can be struck. And we'll find some way to process this stuff in a more timely fashion. I might have to... Even though I'm not interested in becoming a moderator myself, I might have to get more tightly involved with that moderation community just to see what their actual problems are, even though it seems that they're kind of overwhelmed at the moment. And probably because they're overwhelmed, can't even see what the problem is. But you get some glimpse of what's going on there by asking them from time to time, but maybe I need to be more closely involved with seeing who gets labeled and who doesn't and how that all works. I've been trying to stay out of that for two perspectives. One, that I don't want to deal with support requests for, hey, I've been labeled, can you unlabel me? Or also the support request for, hey, that other guy's cheating, I need you to go label him right now. I don't want to get involved in that, I'd just rather do coding. But also from the perspective of, um, I want to engineer the system without biases. And so if I'm actually looking at what who gets labeled and who doesn't, this gives me a bias um, based on just what the group think is thinking. And that makes it harder to think of out of the box solutions. So anyway, that is um that's my Irwin contribution at the moment. Um, next up, I'm not doing this right now, but just to give you a sneak preview of what's coming up next here. Well, I could show you. I was um, there, there's something I could show. Uh, get checkout master. Get branch dash v. Get checkout dark chess. So. I'm looking to implement something similar to what we have at darkchess.com. Again, sorry for the blinding light. Chrome likes to do this, and I don't know how to uh, suppress that. Wait, is it dark chess or is it dark hyphen chess? Or is it HTTPS uh, dark chess? Or is it HTTPS dark hyphen chess? Or I don't remember. There we go. Darkchess.com. Yeah, I think you have to go to secure HTTP to get this. But, um... Nope. Well, whatever. So here's the repository. No screenshots, unfortunately. But we have the game rules. Okay, so yeah, you have like a chessboard. You can see where your pieces can move and where your pieces can capture. Well, I guess you can't see where your pieces can capture, but you can at least see where they can move. Um, I wonder how Ampassant is handled, but regardless, I'm looking to implement this in uh, Lee Chess. Um, it needs to be implemented server-side, and then the server-side perspectives are revealed to the clients. Working on that, that's going to take forever. That's not what I'm going to show you. But that's one of the things in my queue. Um, another thing in my queue um, was Relay Chess. Not doing this on Lee Chess at the moment, but if you go to like relaychess.moo.com, moo with three O's because that's the free domain, you'll see that hey, we've got the site still out there. It's 
migrated from the web hosted, the cloud hosted site, just to my own home PC. Because, you know, didn't want to pay the hosting costs. Um, and it wasn't that popular at the moment. One of the things I do want to do is have the login integrate with Twitch. And how am I going to do this? Well, the plan is to steal code to permissibly steal it from uh, zugaddict.net um, slash bingo um, so we got this connect with twitch integration I've looked at the API I see that there's a way you could say that I want to set this button up on my website with my own key and now that the source code for this page and this site is all revealed, I can integrate this from Bingo Chess um, into, well, let me get that leaderboard out of the way, get the Wikipedia page out of the way. I could integrate this connect with Twitch with the Relay Chess so anybody can log in and not have to create an account. And every time Zug forgets his password, I won't have to email him it. Um, it's just Twitch OAuth, but you know, I'm not a web developer, I don't, I get the concept of OAuth, I've never succeeded at it, but, um, I am going to succeed with this. Anyway, this is coming up in the queue, just doing this Twitch OAuth integration using some Node.js library. Um, okay. Um, but does that work with Node.js? I guess this is Twitch.js. Um, also, does it does it work with my particular whatever it is that Relay Chess here is working in? Like, uh, I'm sorry, does this work with Angular and Node.js? Um, well, Angular is just the front end presentation. Of course, it works with Angular. Um, but, yeah, does this work with uh, Node.js? Probably. Right, right. Now, I get the concept. I just need to figure out how it is to integrate that. I've not done any Node.js development of significance, so I need to work with the Twitch API, work with this OAuth integration, Make sure that when they hit the button, this authenticates, and that somehow I get some sort of user ID that I'm able to um, index in my database. Even though I don't have the token, I'm sorry, even though I only have a token, um, I should be able to substitute that for my username and password features that I have here, and no longer need the register button. Um, and then be able to do open sessions and terminate session. Well, I don't need to terminate the session, but I should be able to uh, to sense when a session has been terminated that a token is no longer valid in this business. Um, yeah, we'll just be storing the access token, and when the access token is no longer valid, prompt the user to log in again, and that's okay. Um, Right. Um, but yeah, I need to do that integration. It probably won't be difficult, other than the fact that this is source code that already exists as opposed to writing something from scratch. So there's always some complications in integrating two systems together. It shouldn't be difficult in theory. It's going to be difficult because because I don't know Node.js, because I don't know JavaScript, because I'm learning OAuth even though I understand the concepts, I've not had to execute it in practice. But thanks to the work of the developer who put this source code together, and thanks to Zug for publishing his Bingo Chess source code, I can take these two pieces, put them together, deal with all the BS that comes from all the idiosyncrasies from both of those, and from the fact that we're dealing with this Twitch API stuff, which I don't claim to be an expert in that either. Yeah.
Yeah, let's do it in Mithril. No, let's do it in Haskell. Let's do it in Brainfuck. Why not? Um, or Cobol. Can you imagine doing this in Cobol and requiring people to, like, pay money to do it? But yeah, the idea is, like, once I take that OAuth integration from Bingo Chess here and implement that in the Relay Chess, um, that should be comparatively simple compared to the next project after that. Which is, you notice how the site goes down from time to time. I'd like to be able to make changes for stability or whatever. I'm going to figure out how in Linux without installing Eclipse to compile this stuff. Because I don't want to use Eclipse. I want to be able to build from an environment that does not depend on Eclipse. I know Zug loves Eclipse. Bless him for that. I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole because I have to do that for work. And if I start doing stuff with Eclipse here, that becomes work. So for fun, we're going to do it outside of Eclipse. We're going to find a way to make the Gradle build work or Maven or whatever we want to do outside of Eclipse. I can even do an Ant script. I don't care. We could deal with, like, Kiln if we want. But... Um, yeah. Right. So that's the next thing. Uh, so if I want to build from the command line, you can either do it by hand or set up Gradle. So I think I'll probably... Oh, I'll just do it by hand then first and then set up Gradle second because Gradle is going to be a little bit more difficult than doing it by hand. Even though by hand is more manual effort. Um... But once I've got it working by hand, presumably with like Ant scripts, I've done Ant for Java compilation before, it's no big deal. Um, and then I can worry about how to do it with Gradle the right way. Um, yeah, the dependencies are all in separate repos, because, oh, okay, so it's all designed around a Gradle build, ideally. That's cool. Yeah, I have started setting up a Gradle build from a command line. Um, didn't get very far with it and got sidetracked by all these other projects I'm working on. But it's good to know that I can do it by hand. Because I know how to do that. That's a simple task. Doing it with Gradle is probably not too hard either. Um, once you've got one example working. But... Um, but yeah, I'll do the simple thing first to verify it works. Verify I'm not like missing something stupid, like having the wrong version of Java or something else that's messed up on my PC. And once I've made sure that that's all sane, then I'll make sure I've got Gradle set up properly, and then I can do a Gradle build, and it'll be beautiful and reproducible elsewhere, and all that good business. But yeah. Zug says stuff about like this not being stable, or I don't know why this goes down. No idea. Um, yeah, no, it's human nature to not have to go into things that any deeper than necessary. Get, oh, push F origin dark chess. We just rebase that from time to time atop the latest master. Um, oh yeah, and there's the other thing about allowing takebacks and simuls, which is just hideously broken. Uh, let's just peek at that, because we can. Git rebase this upon master, push this simul takeback doesn't work. Oops, I forgot I actually have the issue number 2008 and, or 2088 in there. So that's going to actually notify people on that issue that I've rebased it. Oh well. Um, so then we got our build script, which I've updated over and over just to try to keep track of what's the latest, greatest way of building stuff. Um, 
and pulling in the dependent seasons. All that. Um, I've already got GOIP installed. This particular flavor of how to do a build is no longer up to date. Let me update the build script. So, latest greatest should be um, for your own ability to read this. I'm going to uncomment that. So, we're going to get all our dependencies. Oh, actually, yeah, this still applies. Get full upstream master and get submodule update and compile and build build the graphics and then bin GOIP installs the GOIP database um, so this actually got more verbose over time where did this oh right no SVG cleaner is an argument I added so now that's up to date with respect to these other things um, there's stuff for like installing my open SSL key, which I was trying to do like Let's Encrypt, and it didn't work because I don't have my own uh, registered domain because I'm under a dynamic DNS domain. So for my own subdomain, I'm not able to do Let's Encrypt unless I actually go out to like GoDaddy or somebody and purchase a domain. Um, I'm not able to do let's encrypt which is okay because I don't need secure HTTP on my site anyway I mean if you guys trust that my site's secure <laughs> okay that's great but yeah this is why I don't want usernames and passwords on my site um, so yeah this is the first time installation we I mean this is we always have to do the pull from master etc etc um, this updates all the sub-modules, etc. But, um, what was this for? Why do I have a thing that says, like, UI build and build all the UI stuff? I don't think I need that. Um, I was at some point having... Well, no, that was when I was making changes to Scala Chess. Um... I don't remember why. There was something variant related, I think, or insufficient material. No, that. No, the Scala Chest doesn't have insufficient material rules, but I think there was something variant related that was fixing in Scala Chest or adding there, and was advised that we're not implementing Dark Chess in Scala Chess. And separately, I was trying to do like Flick Chess, and. I mean, that UI stuff's going to be rewritten pretty soon anyway, using Snap DOM or whatever. Um, because that's what um, Debo is interested in doing at the moment. Just to improve the performance of the site and improve the stability and make sure that um, all our new features for analysis and cloud analysis and all that work well across all the pages. And that maybe things like tactics might have more features or be more consistent with the user experience for analysis or for position setup or for studies and all that stuff. Um, wait, what? Can't be worse than Zug harvesting all the plain text Lee Chess passwords. Oh, okay, yeah, you mean not harvesting. I mean, maybe that is the right word, but you mean yeah, he's not like going out and fetching those, but he's encouraging people to submit their plain text passwords through his site. Uh, at least, whatever. But that's not his fault. Anyway, yeah, so the one of the things I do want to do... Uh, okay, so I updated this build script. Um, you can now see that... Well, it's not that much cleaner. Um, but yeah, if I want to do get status, this shows that I'm on branch dark chess. I have side multi back. And then I should be able to just build the project. I should have started this while I was blithering, but oh well. Um, 
there are three SSH keys that have authorization for the VPS. So any of those three people could see the past. Ah, 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 that's great. Yeah. Well, what can you do? I mean, Lee Chess is... I mean, we've been... Zug's been asking Lee Chess for a better API. Um, he's been doing his due diligence and requesting this stuff. Um, and they've been saying, well, what do you need it for? And he's saying, well, for the stuff I want to do. And he's saying, what? they say, well, they have other priorities too. So. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, I guess you'll never figure out that my password's password1, then. So. Um... Yeah, password one, most secure password ever. So yeah, this um, so I built my build script to automatically go fetch all the dependent modules or submodules, and then do the normal. Um, this is used as a simple build tool, which is also somehow using Yarn to pull in dependencies. I think for UI building, it's faster. It's also separated from the NPM ecosystem as much as we can be separated from that. Uh, I probably don't need to be generating all these pieces every time I do a build, but whatever. Uh, I've also said don't do the SVG cleaner each time you build the pieces because my, pers my particular version of the code that builds these pieces at um, at each resolution. So you take a piece and you're able to rebuild it for each size that the piece needs to be displayed at. And that's, by the way, is why even though we have like SVG files, um, like if you go to the Leeches editor, probably should have just typed in editor, but you go to the analysis board or something, uh, as you resize this board, you see that there's a slider. Wait. Wait, I was going to say that like for each one of these values, there's a different size piece. That's not the case. I was going to say, yeah, these are all SVGs, but we generate so many different sizes of these pieces. I thought we generated one for each setting on this slider, but that's not the case. Because there's tons of settings on this slider. It's like 32 different settings or something. There's no way that we're generating that many versions of these pieces. So I am confused. We're taking a SVG file and generating from it another SVG file for some reason. I thought it was that we could scale the pieces, but... Um, um, yeah, but, right. There still might be some benefits to, if it knows that your board size by default is some size, then it can send you pieces that are smaller and not have to send you the full SVG. Maybe that's why we have multiple piece sizes. If not, I don't know why not. Um, I mean, sure, there's like the mini boards that you see everywhere. Like, if you're looking at a tournament, uh, if I still have this open, yeah, if we go over to a tournament, just look at one of these, you see there's the mini board here. This is of a fixed dimension, so if we have 2D pieces and we pick a different piece set, like we pick um, a piece set of, I don't know, this one, we'll see that we got pieces of the appropriate dimension for this board. We didn't have to get the full SVG of the largest possible piece. So this did save sending a few bytes over the wire uh, to have smaller pieces. So that's probably it. Um, does anybody actually play using this set, by the way? Probably not. Oh, wait. That's made. Wow. That was a beautiful checkmate. Where'd that go? Where did that go? Is this? That wasn't it. 
Oh, I can hover over these, too. Where, yeah, this one. This final move here. Knight to b6, mate. Like, you got the knight and the queen sitting nearby. Your own queen, your own king is under attack from this stuff. Although, I guess you don't need to be too concerned, because there's not too much going on. Well, so instead of defending your bishop back here, you just checkmate him. Um... Yeah, right. Um, right, but you might be able to have smaller SVG files if you don't have the same resolution. Right, no, I get that. It's just a set of vectors. But if you have this tiny little dot, or this tiny little piece, you don't need to have the same resolution as you, or the same signal quality. So you got these pieces. Um, if you increase the board dimension, you need to have greater level of detail. Um, but if you have a really small piece, you might not need to have the same level of detail. You might not need to be able to see all the parts of this sprocket here, or the hex wrench, or the carrot. Or, you know, any of these. You might not need to be... Uh, granted, um, I'm not using SVG Cleaner, so I'm not doing anything that simplifies the SVG and minifies it. Um, right. No, I'm just saying, though, you might be able to take out some of the vectors altogether if the SVG Cleaner determines that there's a simpler representation at a lower resolution that you might be able to minify in the same way that you can minify just about anything. Um, you could probably minify the uh, SVG itself. Okay, so I did manage to stall for enough time to get this up and running. Um, so I have to make a web request, or it actually doesn't come online. Which is pretty funny, but whatever. Um, don't need this open. Uh, technically don't need that open either. So yeah, this takes... Well, I've got other things going on on the server at the moment. For example... I've got, um, I'm participating in the stockfish testing queue here. Uh, there's all kinds of tests that are backed up here. Um, there's all kinds of tuning sessions that are going on. So, my latest submission to this queue. Well, you see, okay, here's my machine. I've, I've got three cores running. Some generous fellow is donating 15 cores to this pool, which is helping quite a great deal. Um, but yeah, we've got days worth of stuff backed up in this queue. Um, and what I want to see done is I want this damn thing to be accepted or tested. I, this is the thing I was testing earlier. I want this, uh, this is my most recent change, that when we capture a piece, it counts for two pieces in Crazy House because it gets added to our hand. Um, we want to double the priority of that. This might not actually be an improvement because I might have to also double this accordingly, but for clarity of code, um, this should do a doubling because elsewhere we're doubling the capture value we're actually having a threshold and elsewhere in numerous places we're doubling the value of a capture so for consistency we should also indicate that here also we probably shouldn't be doing some of the things we are doing for crazy house that just so wildly differ from what we do for normal chess like why would it matter where your piece is going with respect to the distance to the kings. Why do we only check that here as opposed to all the other places we could check this too? I don't know. 
but apparently for move ordering for the move selector, we care about how close the move is to um, to our king, whereas normally we would care how close is the move to the other side of the board. But apparently placing pieces next to our own king is pretty useful too. But uh, I need to try to simplify that at some point, but not as part of this change. This change, I'm just helping fix the move selector to apply the same bonuses that we apply elsewhere for capture sequences. But anyway, that's also running on my server. So that's taking up three of my cores. So that's why I only have one core operating all of Lee Chess here. Um, which is okay, because I don't use it that much here. Um, oh, so I was going to say Dark Chess. Um, I actually don't have anything visually to show for it. I'm not sure why I thought I did. Last time I was trying to make changes in the UI and found ways to get the UI to highlight stuff more interestingly, but for Dark Chess what you need... I guess I could show the only thing that's there, which is if I go to my player list... Why am I showing Dark Chess on a light background? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, yeah, that's more like it. So, I recently played some games with AI level 1 and AI level 2. I had to unmark them to be able to play against them, which is pretty funny. Um, or at least to get them to participate in my simul. But... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, not on Dark Chess. We were focusing on simul takebacks. That's why I was doing a simul. Simul takebacks don't work. Um, they only work if you're sitting at the board, which is great for the participants, because the participants are always there at the board, but the simul host is not able to differentiate um, between boards. Um, between you've been given a takeback offer on one board versus you've been given a takeback offer on a different board, that just doesn't work. Um, he once tried building and running <laughs> from Vagrant. Yep. Yep, Vagrant works great except when it doesn't. Then it doesn't work. Sorry to hear that, though. Hopefully it wasn't a lot of manual effort. I, I'm hopeful. And if it was, I'm sorry that they misadvised you on that. Yeah, somebody thought, hey, this is great. I've got a Vagrant build. It works on my environment, and it works once for me. I've made my contribution. I'm done. And nobody ever updated that. And it was never tested in other environments. Well, no, I'm sorry. That's wrong. It was tested in multiple environments. But, I mean, I don't know Vagrant. I get the concept. I've even created Vagrant-based environments been a total pain in the ass. It's not worth it. Unless you have some really highly specialized thing where you can't tell people, you know, just be a good administrator. Don't suck at it. Um, but, um, but yeah, I get that not every developer is an administrator, and there are good reasons to set up things using Vagrant. Um, one being that being able to create and destroy environments on a whim makes it a lot easier to test things. But again, that goes back to my point about special cases and that you don't, not every project needs a vagrant environment. Lee Chess does not need a vagrant environment. It's complicated enough already. Yes, having a vagrant environment would help you set up automated scripts that you could run and do every time you build things. But, I mean, you could build a space shuttle. Um, you could build something with the level of quality it takes to get to the moon. Um, but there's some cost in doing all these great things. Um, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to blame it on VirtualBox would not hesitate at all. Alright, so 
yeah, we see this is a stockfish testing queue. Honestly, I should advertise this more often than I do because we've only got a few machines contributing to the queue, but whatever. It still works great thanks to one person's generous donation. Um, and I guess also thanks to the fact that we're not constantly contributing changes, except right now apparently we are because I have one concept of how to fix the damn bugs. Another person's like, yeah, but we could just tune all the variables and that might hide the bug. And I'm like, no. We're going to deal with this. We're going to fix it. We'll do things right. Um, yeah, maybe Docker. Docker might be better. I don't know. I mean, pick your tool of choice. It doesn't matter if nobody's going to update it anyway. In the sense of um, every time our leechess dependencies change, somebody's got to change the vagrant file or the docker file or whatever file you use to configure this all. Um, if nobody's going to regularly commit to doing that, then there's just no point. Um, and since I've already got my environment set up, and since I'm a decently competent Linux administrator, and since there's no need for me to repeatedly destroy and create my environment, um, I don't need to set up like Docker or Vagrant or anything. It doesn't benefit me in any way because I'm not benefiting from creating and destroying environments or doing things environment related. There's already tons of unit tests built into Leechess, and they're quite good. Um, and um, wouldn't surprise people to hear that we've got a staging environment somewhere. We don't actually publish the URL for that anywhere, but we do stage the environment. Um, and we're able to test things on the stage and do some alpha testing. And, you know, when... Um, everything works great in stage after considerable testing then <laughs> then we get uh, then we just deploy it we have thoroughly code reviewed it we got all the unit tests in place we've done our alpha testing we deploy it to the site and um, our administrators and developers are on full tilt as uh, or full alert, we'll say, as we deploy a new feature. And if it ends up breaking something, if it's really terrible, we revert. But if it's something we can patch, we patch it. And, but by the time things make it to the Leech Us site, um, they've been through code review, they've been through unit testing, they've been through alpha testing. Um, because we're doing things in Scala, there's less potential for breakage than if you're doing it in Java. Yeah, if this were written in Java, we'd be fucked. Um, this was originally written in PHP, and that's why TiVo understands that um, there's benefits to functional programming. And he's had experience dealing with all the problems that come from using a technology that's bad. Um, and yeah, using functional programming is allowing us to, in some small sense, use the production site as a beta site. Even though technically Leechess is stable, it's not in beta, we're doing all these releases, and occasionally we have to roll back a release, so I would still call it beta. But we do have a stable release. People can download that stable release and release it on their machines. That's Leech Us 1.0. There, It is a stable release. You can find it on GitHub. problem with stable releases is, um, you know, they aren't the cutting edge, latest, greatest stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm actually curious when the Leech Us 1.1 stable release will happen. Probably after this major refactor that's been started, uh, if I had to guess. Um, 
Yeah, they want isolation and infrastructure reproducibility. And great. You want isolation? Use VirtualBox. Be a competent sysadmin. But if you want it conveniently, then yeah, using Vagrant and using Docker allows you, through many inconvenient steps, to uh, set up conveniently uh, an isolated environment. But it, it doubles your work up front to save you a little bit of time downstream. But having those guarantees does have value. If you're if you're doing things for like real business and the, I mean there's value to using Vagrant, there's value to using Docker. There's value to what was it, Cuber Meets? There's value to all these things. Um um, I mean, yeah, if you really want isolation, there's a funny little um, operating system out there. It's a reasonably secure operating system. It isolates all your stuff and basically prevents your one application or your one part of your environment from corrupting other parts of your environment. And it's beautiful. Um, like, I don't know. If this had screenshots, I would show it. It's largely theoretical. <laughs> okay, we got a video tour. But screenshots would be pretty cool, too. Um, but yeah, it's a secure operating system. Um, it's got, like, secure compartmentalization and operating system freedom. and allows you to run, like, Windows and Linux and all the stuff under one OS and uh, secure all the applications and all the stuff. It's a very secure operating system. It, it works reasonably well. Yeah. But man, you want... There's a price for everything. There's a benefit for every benefit, but there's a price that's paid for each thing. Um... And yeah, no developer is setting up Leech Us inside all this complicated stuff because although there are benefits, all the developers are reasonably confident, or competent rather, at um, at setting up um, a Linux environment with the right stuff installed. And the dependencies for this aren't terrible. It's I mean, yes, I did have to install MongoDB. I guess MongoDB is something I'm actually now using for RealHS also. Doesn't mean I'm a fan of it, even though there are tons of benefits. Um, I mean, I get that there's tons of ben. Yeah. I would prefer to do things with a different database, but whatever this works great for their development if ever development completely slowed down it would make sense to use a database like Postgres or something um, and that way you'd be able to get all kinds of relational benefits without having to write tons of stuff but that requires knowing your abstraction perfectly or pretty well up front and never changing it. Um, and that's just not what happened with Leech Us at all. So yeah, MongoDB works great for Leech Us. Um, but yeah, the other dependencies for this aren't bad at all. It's not something that's going to corrupt your environment. Um, it is funny here, like, AI level 1 got pretty good at all these variants, didn't it? Um, yeah, these AIs haven't been playing in some time, we'll say. Um, uh, oh, right, I forgot, there's one other thing that's in my queue, and that's fixing the rating deviation. You see, this AI hasn't, like, played in forever. And by forever, I mean since January. It has not played a game. Um, 
and yet none of its ratings are provisional. That's a bug. That's a bug in Leech Us having to do with rating deviation and Glicko not being completely correct in how they're implemented. Um, that's something they gotta fix at some point. There seems to be at least consensus among the developers that in the dev channel that um, that the rating deviation is something that can be and should be improved. And what this should be is not what was the last value of the rating deviation, but now that I'm looking at this value, recompute it based on what was the last value, but also what was the last date that we had that value, and figure out how many rating periods have passed since that date past. Really you don't need to have the whole rating period concept, but just really somehow have a way of decaying rating deviation back to the 250 value when players are inactive. Um, yeah. I mean, sure. I guess you don't want Scala. You don't want a web server. Yeah, if you want your server to be pretty clean, um, and for some reason having Scala is a bad thing, well, I guess it just makes it harder for you to maintain your server over time. Um, assuming you cho choose to change the purpose of that server's usage. Um, it's like, I don't know, how when we deploy servers, I'm sorry, when we put the Relay Chess server in the cloud, I think we didn't even install some, uh, I think we didn't install Vim, the improved VI. I think we just had just plain old VI there. Because we didn't need improved VI. Like, why would you install all these applications? But, I mean, there's solutions to that too. <laughs> it was a monstrosity. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I guess I didn't know how difficult that was. I remember I installed a another chess server on that relay chess server um, that was just capable of playing uh, Sierra One chess, and so that's gone too, at least in terms of that deployment. Um, but yeah, I remember having issues with the 32 versus 64-bit builds, where I think were mostly sourced just by the code base that I was working with. But yeah, I, I guess I'll take your word for it that setting up that um, RealHS VBS was a monstrosity somehow. suppose from a security standpoint or something. Oh. Um, so yeah, fixing uh, what I was saying earlier is that I want to fix simuls so you can do takebacks. Note that when you're doing a simul, the draw button works just fine. The simul host sees when you're offering a draw, they just don't see when you're offering a takeback. And I've looked at the code and after about an hour figured out that that was because um, the data structures uh, indicate which players are offering draws, but they don't indicate which players are offering takebacks, because takebacks are expected to be handled asynchronously, like it's expected that you're on a game when there is a takeback. However, what surprises me about this is that for correspondence games you can still see takebacks, even though those in general, takebacks are handled asynchronously and through events, and there's no need for the document uh, to, or I'm sorry, there's no need for the web request to expose whether or not there's a takeback most of the time, because you're talking about a chess game that you're playing in progress right now. There's no need to indicate that, oh yeah, um, your opponent's offered a takeback. Um, inside the 
web request that shows like this is the latest move. And because you're able to asynchronously get that event, it doesn't need to be part of the game. Um, unless you have multiple games that are going on simultaneously, in which case you at least need to identify which game the takebacks for. But takebacks do still work for correspondence, even if you're playing multiple correspondence games. So you just need to take that same concept that you do for correspondence and carry it over into simuls, which is probably a mess. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, Apache configuration's a bit of a pain. Um, yeah, moving around stuff is... Yeah, it's, it's difficult to keep up with a enthusiastic developer. <laughs> a sysadmin and a developer are not the same thing. Um, so yeah, I want to fix the simul stuff. Um, beyond that, uh, let's go back here. Oh, I wanted to show not this, but I want to show like official stockfish has made some pretty interesting changes as of late. We'll say lots and lots of really involved stuff. Uh, okay, so we simplify this method. Sure. I actually looked at it. It is actually simpler. Uh, and then we got some stuff about race conditions, where we're able to remove attributes. Um, actually, this isn't what concerned me. Even though this fixes race conditions, it's largely in code that I've not had to customize for variants. So this should merge just fine without any kind of problem. Um, when I do merge from upstream into my project. Likewise for this race, suppression, great. Magic index, take all the magics, initialize them in a common place. Again, I've not had to mess with this for variants, um, so that's cool. And yeah, I'm sorry, this is simpler, but despite the fact that this is simpler, it touches Lots of code that I had to customize. Um, it's a clever little trick, by the way. This is saying get a position for various white pieces and black pieces. Okay, so this splits this array into white pieces and black pieces. Sets up all the black pieces on top of the board, the white pieces on the bottom of the board, and returns the FEN. But it sets them up the black pieces on the seventh rank and the white pieces on the second rank. Again, pretty clever. Um, but yeah, this stuff with like thresholds and is my move legal? This in particular is going to be a total pain to merge. I'm not looking forward to it. Um, but I want to get my latest change in place before I merge that. My latest change being some actual changes to the threshold code that's changed by that same merge. Um, oh, hey, we got a comment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, yep, I guessed it. Uh, I got feedback. This is redundant because of the cache above it. Okay, so he's saying, yeah, I can actually do better. I was saying, I don't know, but he's saying, yes, it's possible to improve this, so I can improve that. That's cool. Yeah, I, I knew I was going to get feedback. Oh, hey, gosh, this is one way. Um, all right, so... I don't, not sure if anybody could just like read this code and understand. This is a Mongo index. 
This is also a Mongo index. It's just unnecessary due to that one. But this is listing users. This is listing just user IDs. Um, can anybody just like look at that and know? Can I just use the same I? I don't know. Or like, what's the right way to deal with this and to extract the IDs from this list as a list of IDs? I'd want a map. This is not a reduction. This is a mapping. Or I could do similar to what was done elsewhere. Where like here, just extract the ID out of the user. So, you need to say flat map, um, and then for each user in the list, uh, well, I don't know. This is saying flat map, so I got a future, and then if I find a list in that future, pass that list into this, but I want to first process that list to transform it into a list of user IDs. Or, alternatively, I want to change the definition of from leaderboard to accept a list of users and then do whatever it's got to do to apply on that list of users, um, which is probably the better approach. Let's view this. Really, I'm only viewing this so I can get back over to um, move request, which says, like, I'm sorry, that's not it. So looking over to Erwin API, Erwin API generates the thing that goes into the queue. So when we're inserting um, from the leaderboard, I need to change this to say accept a list of users. Oh, oh, this is actually simple. Yeah, just change this to a list of users. And then from that user, say user.id. Again, as I was having so many other problems compiling this, that, um, yeah, let's go fix that. Clear git branch dash v git checkout this grep wr ids by id except don't do this with dash w. So yeah, we're going to go into here, bin this file. Um, so this is redundant. Um, so just delete that. SBT compile. This will tell you, hey dummy, you deleted that function. What are you doing trying to reference it? Um, and yeah, so we'll deal with this one compiler error, error at a time. It's a fun way even at work to, um, I don't know, proof by compilation we'll say. You start with the lowest level thing and then build up from it. And um, this of course basically requires understanding that um, this low-level code change um, could s safely be made and that there is a means for resolving all the errors um, because you understand your data and you understand what it is that you're doing to manipulate that data at some level you understand that you're able to make changes to the code and expect things to come out the other end in a sane way so yeah, you make the first change, break the code, ask the compiler to deal with it. Um, okay, compiler has dealt with it, tells you this is where to go next. Okay, so we go here next, uh, line 30. Yeah, right, so this is no longer online IDs, but get, but it's now online.get. Of course, this will get passed into from leaderboard. Uh, from leaderboard itself, um, missing argument list. This is the thing I was seeing earlier that confused the heck out of me. But, um, Erwin API.scala. So 
So this is no longer going to be a list of user.id. It's going to be a list of user. Um, user still imported up there, so that's good. And then we say instead of user ID, we say just user. Uh, hopefully ID is the correct name of that. We'll find out. Compile. How much is still broken? Yeah, so hopefully... Um, Oh, right, so this is, it was looking for a parameter because flat map could not be applied to an expression that did not exist, or something like that. However, now when I say flat map, it'll be able to apply from leaderboard to each, or to the future list that's defined by top50online.get. Um, yeah, let's fix that. Plus, this means that that new function I introduced can be removed, which is pretty nice. Um, oh, hey, look, it compiles. Get status shows three files changed. Get diff shows the contents of those changes. I mean, basically what we're just looking at, where we're saying top 50 online instead of, instead of top 50 online IDs. And then we say for user instead of user.id, and you know, pretty simple. Um, uh, wait. What's the name of this method that I... There it is. Well, oh sorry, that's not a method. That's just a value that's publicly exposed. Git status, git add modules, git status. This shows pretty clearly this is what's changed. Uh, git commit, remove, um, redundant method. It's not a method. Um, value. Um, in favor of... There we go. Get push origin or win, etc, etc. There we go. That works just fine. Yeah. Okay, so he's paying attention. That's cool. Where I was tripped up by flat map syntax and strange compiler errors, which have since. Um, it's not subseded. It's not superseded. I don't know. It's not seceded. There's a word. Subsided. That's the word. There we go. Um, I've fixed this in the next commit. Now pushed. Do -do -do. Cool. So, yep, yep, yep. Um, conversation. Wait, do I have to refresh this to actually pull in my change? Yep, that's cool. So then we'll look at the diff and see it's simpler. So I'm able to change from leaderboard, which I guess I didn't change this in the first place. This is always expecting IDs, and now it expects users, and that's perfectly fine, because we're passing in users. So, yay. It helps that I'm changing the only... there's only one consumer of this. 
So since I'm changing that consumer, I have the liberty to change the method signature or function definition. It's not a method. We're not doing things imperatively, but I have the ability to change the method interface um, because I'm changing the only consumer. We have this beautiful abstraction, which for some reason it's beautiful to do. I mean, it, it does keep the environment code quite simple when the implementation is separated. That's great. Um, so what now? Um, yeah, no, I think that's that. Do not generate leaderboard assessments for offline users. Still a request for comment because, you know, this way of saying uh, a user is offline is not perfect. And the fact that a user logs in might be enough to make us have to generate assessments. But the fact that we're generating assessments based on a leaderboard in the first place is pretty silly too. Where this gets problematic is that now we're generating assessments based on um, the top 50 who are logged in at a given time as opposed to the top 200 overall. So it's quite possible that um, we might end up generating more assessments this way over the course of a 24 hour span or the course of a however many hours it takes to build that leaderboard span. But um, that assessment at least will be relevant to who's logged in. And yeah, like I said earlier, this is not a perfect implementation. This is just getting the discussion started so we aren't assessing people who aren't even logged in. And um, this might not be a good idea. This might be a good idea. I don't know. But some compromise will be reached, even if I have to write the code myself. Which I'm doing here. I'm suggesting something. It should improve things in theory, but overall there's better ways to do this. And it involves possibly changing what we're caching server side, I don't know. It's going to require some more work from Tebow potentially, but um, that work will mean that um, this Irwin will be able to um, relieve the hard labor that administrators are putting in just constantly watching error reports. If you see somebody who's got like a 98% assessment saying, you know what, this guy doesn't look like he's playing honestly. Once it gets over some really, really high activation threshold, this should be more than just an advisory. This should be Irwin goes rogue. It says, guys, you aren't paying any attention. Clearly, this this particular user should be dealt with, sort of thing. Um, I'm actually curious. This came from somewhere. Could we identify, like, who played these five opponents that this got triggered on? This is shaming somebody publicly. It's not like we made the effort to anonymize this. Oh, actually. Oh, this is great. This is wonderful. Um, you know that LeechS database, um, after that presentation, um, yeah, Tebo said he would release the LeechS database to the community at large. Um, he's since released it. So somebody could actually go in, search the database for who played against these five opponents. Who was the cheater? who played a 10 minute game against Gauss, who played a 5 plus 10 against Stanikov, and so forth. Yeah, this is publicly shaming somebody. This is, There's gotta be a better, more politically correct way to present this diagram. That's pretty funny. Because this isn't test data. This totally should be test data, but isn't. So, at least, I mean, what if it is? Maybe it is test data. But 
Test data is never of the same level of quality as the actual production data. Um, where's the Lee Chess database? Let's see, Lee Chess database. It's at database.leechess.org. Um, it's in PGN format. So, yeah, if anybody feels so moved, they can inspect that database, try to figure out who it was that Irwin tracked down and told the moderators that, hey, mods, um, this guy's cheating. Right now, it, Irwin is still taking an advisory role, but <sighs> come on. Irwin should return a number between 0 and 100, and if that number is close enough to 100 or close enough to 0, or however you want to do it, there should be some threshold where Irwin just goes rogue and says, you know what, I'm done advising on this guy. I'm just going to mark him. And that will deal with the situation where you're not going to have a moderator there 24-7 to support this. Because we're not a commercial site, unlike some commercial sites that claim to do a lot about cheating and take it quite seriously. And I don't buy any of that, but maybe some people do and they believe that there's a moderator sitting there at a computer 24-7 keeping track of who is naughty and who's nice. I mean, maybe there is. I really don't think so, because that's not a good business decision, but maybe there is. Maybe they're not cutting corners. Um, but yeah, Irwin should just be able to return a number, and we'll be transparent and say, yeah, sometimes it advises the mods, sometimes it just says, you know what, I'm just going to label this guy. I think that's as good as can possibly get until it gets fully sentient. And once you've hit full sentience and it's smarter than all the moderators, at least make sure there's a kill switch somewhere, you know, before it decides that all humans are cheaters and have to be eliminated, and, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, always include a kill switch. So, but yeah. That's the state of the code address, um, as I've been starting to name that sort of session where I just go across all the things that I'm thinking about just randomly. Um, I should probably do that in a more formalized uh, agenda, but, you know, it's for fun, there's no money involved, I don't get compensated in any way for that. I do get to work with good developers and learn what it is that they know. So there's some experience to be gained from this all. Also, it allows me to dabble in a variety of technologies and build up a repertoire and have an online exhibit of, hey look, I am good at stuff. But, I don't know, it's... Um, part of this is that's satisfying is just that it's contributing to an online community an open source atmosphere um, and community and ecosystem um, and helping chess players learn to play better and not have to deal with this cheating thing so often and yeah unfortunately dealing with this cheating thing is part of running a site it's not the main part but it is part so um, I might be out of topics other than like yeah I've said look I these are all these things I want to work on I never have enough time to do them that's okay I have at least enough time to submit a code change um, I'm still amused by my code change that I submitted because like this is such a primitive thing in terms of like Look at all the scale of stuff, and look at all the Lee Chess stuff that's going on here. And I just said, like, take this, copy, paste, replace, put this in place instead. Take this, copy, paste, replace, whatever. Like, this is not building a system from scratch or anything like that. This is taking existing functions and cludging them all to fit together in the crudest possible fashion. 
and not really making an effort to do what I think ought to be done, which is um, at the time of trying to prioritize all the requests, then set the priorities based on what users are actually logged in. Because a player can't cheat while they're logged out. So deal with... Um, well, I guess there is a reason to deal with logged out cheaters still. The reason to deal with them would be if... Um, due to the rating refund program, which I disagree with, but it, it's the policy of the site. It's important to give players refunds for their ratings they were cheated out of in a timely fashion. <sighs> Which is silly. But, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think the next highest priority, even though dark chess would be good fun, I think a pretty high priority for Lee Chess and since nobody else is doing it, it falls to me to do it, uh, would be to go into the ratings source code. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a ratings module? Yes, I remember correctly. There is a rating module. Go into here and fix the rating deviation stuff. Fix everywhere that we need to see the rating deviation don't expose the value that's in the database, but expose a computed value that depends on the time since the last update. Or the time since the game, last time the user played a rated game. Um, since we're doing functional programming, this should not be a difficult change to do. It still falls to me to do it. I'm still going to do it, but just not now. But yeah, that's coming. Um, Cap Glico2 Volatility. What is this? Um, what is this? Volatility less than max volatility times 2. Um, mm -hmm. Um, was anything else changed in this commit? I just don't understand. No, I'm sorry, this, these are the files that were changed during this commit. There was no issue for this commit, other than maybe volatility looked silly. Um, this by definition is wrong. Oh my goodness. And the thing about volatility is we aren't even using it. Volatility gets applied at, well, I'm sorry, we're we're doing a terrible job at maintaining it. The point of it is to keep track of during a rating period how many What's my likelihood of um, my rating wildly changing? How many standard deviations do I think my rating is going to change by during a period? I had to read through the Glico documentation to figure this out. Um, and since Leechess has only one rating period and it never ends, then volatility is just a measure of, you know, how much does my rating change? How volatile is my rating? Um, so capping that is pretty artificial and is to fix something else, whatever that something else was. It might just be that somebody didn't like the number that they were looking at, or they were noticing that ratings are volatile. Anyhow, that should be undone at some point. Or theoretically, it should be unnecessary to have that there in the first place, but whatever. Um, I guess I don't care. As long as volatility never exceeds 0.1, we don't need to have this cap. In it doesn't matter whether the cap's in place or not. But yeah, I need to fix this code to 
Well, apparently, this actually identifies pretty nicely. If you want to make a change that affects the entire system, go make it here. Specifically, go make it um, here. So if I want to recompute the rating deviation um, on demand, I've got to add in whatever parameters I need to add in so I get visibility to the last updated date. And then um, when I have that visibility, just perform a function that decays the rating accordingly, as if there were multiple rating periods, but there aren't. And the point of doing that would be that if a person's playing like 500 bullet games a day, um, that person should not see their rating jump all over the place. Like a person who is playing a bullet game once a year. A person who plays less frequently should see their rating increase and decrease quite a bit. A person who plays all the time should not see their rating fluctuate as much. Um, what this means is that um, players are ending up with pretty high ratings on the leaderboard because their RD never goes down. Their rating deviation is always pretty high because we never decrease that because unless they're playing against people of their own strength. But by playing people way below their own strength, they increase the rating deviation. And then they just play against anybody and their rating goes up again. The key there is just they don't lose. But yeah, rating deviation is kind of bastardized at this point because we don't keep track of, um, well, I mean, it's great that when you play against people close to your own rating, it's supposed to go down, but that's not what's happening. The rating deviation is not going down because the rating period never ends. Uh, so we need to have a way to increase the rating deviation over time such that decreases can be regulated by this variable called tau, um, which lies out here, I think. T-A-U. Okay, it's in this repository somewhere. Yeah, this stuff configures um, just how much rating deviations change over time. And again, people in the forums have come up with all these complicated, stupid suggestions about, I'll just tweak this one thing and it'll be more like the USCF formula. And I say stupid because it, these people are just not informed about the situation. Not because they're dumb but because they're introducing XY problems where they're saying just tweak this one thing and it'll go away and that's not the case. We need to fix uh, the rating deviation to be more accurate such that people who play frequently will have a lower rating deviation even if that means that they can no longer achieve like these 3200 ridiculous ratings. And then once you have the rating deviation accurate and people's ratings aren't skyrocketing anymore, then people can stop complaining about Leech's ratings being overrated because while they will be normalized at 1500, because that's what Glico2 says to do, it says player ratings should start at 1500, even though other sites don't do that. I don't know why not. Maybe Fix does, I don't remember. But, um, but yeah, they'll be more Fix-like unless leech us like and so there won't be this big discrepancy between ratings on all the sites um so yeah this is next up not doing it right now but that's just the background of course now that i've explained it all i'll have to explain it again next time i do it but you know that's how it goes um so i guess that's the state of the code address the code address huh Never thought about that. Okay. Anyway, um, that's been fun. So much to do, no time to do it in, and everything's the top priority, but some things are more important than others. No, no but seriously, some of these are more important. Um, I do need to fix that rating deviation thing. I do want to go in and do Twitch integration for Relay Chess, get that out of the way. And then, you know, sometime maybe get around to the bingo chess, gradle, whatever stuff, but, um, 
also if this test ever completes, um, then go ahead and port, uh, what is it? Where is it? This thing, this latest attempt, if this goes well at this test, and it goes well at the slower time control, then that's the thing I'm going to port. Else if that fails, um, then I'm just going to merge this into the main repository and then merge upstream stockfish changes on top of it. And that's going to be a pain, but needs to be done at some point. So yeah, those are all the balls up in the air. Um, yeah, separately from that, on my stream I finally got all the Streamlabs integration up and working so I could see when people host me and such. So that was good fun. Um, so uh, I think that's it. So anybody who managed to survive through this entire marathon, um, kudos to you. Again, I don't know how you do it, but I guess we're learning something together. Um, but yeah, that's Scala, Leela, Category Theory, Functions, Monads, all that good stuff. And all the projects I'm working on, and various technologies, and OAuth, HTTPS, Node.js, and um, ways of setting up an environment. Basically, we've touched on everything there is to know. There's nothing more you'll ever need to know. You just watch this. Why even bother, like, going to college lectures and such? I'm joking. There's value in all those things, too. But, yeah. Thanks for watching. I'm get around to playing some games soon. Maybe get Zug off of his Hearthstone addiction. Maybe get him addicted to this other game, Fairy. Or Faria, whatever it's called. But, yeah. Thanks for watching. And see you next time.